Hello, doc lovers. Welcome back to BYOD, Bring Your Own Doc, and our special coverage of Sundance 2015. One of the more controversial uh, and talked about films here at Sundance is a film called Terror, and that's Terror with the T in parens, and it's made by two directors who've joined me today, Lyric R. Cabral and David Felix Sutcliffe. Um, and uh, they came together to kind of expose, not even kind of, very much expose uh, sort of the subterfuge that goes into FBI informants and what that world is like, how that works, and what the implications are for us um, in the counterterrorism uh, fight. And, uh, and there's a, apparently a lot of fallout from that fight, some of which we're not really aware of until we see this film. So welcome to BYOD. Um, so what inspired you to make this film? Tell me the story, lyric, of what happened with you, if you would. Um, well, when I was 19 years old, I was a journalism student. Um, I'm a photographer, a photojournalist by <clears throat> my profession, but I was studying journalism just so I could learn the means of telling a good story. And I had a neighbor who was very intriguing. Um, he was someone who was always well-dressed. He just was very charismatic. He always had interesting stories to share. And something about him, I was really like intrigued to get to know him. And so over the course of three years, we were just conversing in his apartment, um, mostly every day, just talking about, you know, I was 19, I was developing ideologies, I was changing religions. All of these things were topics of conversation, politics. You know, he was just like probing my mind, but I'm a very curious person. So I, as many questions as he had for me, I had as many for him. And so I think we developed a pretty unique trust. And we got to know each other over the course of four years. So I remember going to school on a Thursday and coming back. I remember I had plans with my neighbor on a Saturday. And the apartment was just sort of cleared out. There was no furniture there. There was almost no indication that anyone had ever lived there. So as I'm staring into an empty apartment, wondering what the hell could be going on, he calls me. And he sounded almost as if someone had a gun to his head. I'd never heard that frantic tone in his voice. He said, Lyric, if anyone comes looking for me, don't give them any information. You get their information. And I, I was just so freaked out because of the tone and what I'm staring into an empty apartment. And I just said, why? Quite simply, why? And he said, well, I can't really tell you. You'll have to travel down to visit me. I'm no longer in New York State. I'm in South Carolina. And I was in school. I was in no rush, because that was a crazy scenario. But I was still intrigued. But I was also a little scared. And so when I went down to South Carolina, he confessed to me that what I had, the person I had met was, in essence, a cover. It was his double life. And he was really had been working for the FBI at this point for over a decade. And the apartment in which we had had all these conversations, in which we had grown close, was paid for by the FBI. And that apartment was wired with audio and video surveillance. And the apartment was part of a sting operation set up to catch Tariq Shah who was arrested in 2005. And because of Tariq's arrest and, and Saeed Torres' involvement in Tariq's arrest, he had to leave Flea Town. And Tariq was, was being surveilled for what reason? What had Tariq done? Well, um, government records indicate that Tariq was surveilled because he offered, an informant went to a bookstore in Brooklyn that Tariq frequented. And that informant went to the bookstore asking who could send money abroad. Um, you know, it was a Muslim bookstore, and so I guess they were looking for foreign connections as far as who could get money abroad. And actually, Tariq was there, but he didn't say I could. Someone said, I know someone who could send money. It's Tariq. And that opened up Tariq's investigation. And it turned out to be true? Um, Tariq never went to trial, so that particular allegation was not, never fully revealed. That was an allegation, but since okay. he never went to trial, it was never. He was arrested, but never went to trial. Yes, he took a plea. So uh, Islamophobia is a, a theme in your film as well. Uh, in the, you know, as you started to get into this, you went down to South Carolina and this friend of yours, who you thought was your friend, who you thought was a lawyer, he ended up agreeing to be in your film. Well, you know, there's a little bit of an interim. So after that, I was really repulsed when he told me that. I was 19, I wasn't ready, I didn't know the landscape of counterterrorism, I knew I wanted to tell a really good story but wasn't fully equipped. And so for 10 years, I, you know, I, I didn't want to negate the story, so I just called him once a month, how are you and where are you? Just not knowing what I would do but wanting to stay in good contact. And David and I worked together during this time where I was living with, with Saeed. Yeah, Lyric and I taught together at a program and one of our students was actually arrested by the FBI at that time, a 16 year old girl. Muslim girl named Adama Ba, and the FBI said she was a potential suicide bomber. So I started working on a film about her, and while I was working on that film, I started to kind of study the other counterterrorism cases that the FBI was conducting, and saw this pattern of informants going into communities, developing relationships with young men, 
and ultimately convincing them to participate in terrorist activities. And I thought that would make an amazing story. That's you know, very these similar to that uh, film, Better This World, yeah, that it's we were discussing. Fantastic mm -hmm. film. Um, again, and, but in that case, and I guess what you're saying is in this case as well, the informant is actively setting up a case. Yeah. The, whether the case exists or not. Yeah, a lot of these cases, the informants are being sent into communities, not to uncover some terrorist network, but to, I, they develop relationships with people who the FBI deems as persons of interest. You know, this person, for whatever reason, is of interest. And we want to find out whether he is susceptible to participating in terrorist activity. And so the informant is then sent to see if he can encourage this person or test his, you know, his interest, you know. And that's, what, that, what, that's, what, that's what's happening in case after case after case. You know, it's not that they are uncovering terrorists, they are really cultivating terrorists. And I thought that, you know, I thought that would be an amazing story. Just like what, po on a political level, incredibly problematic, and on a human dramatic level, th these relationships, those friendships that are created, because these investigations are not quick. These take months and sometimes years. And I happened to, you know, mention this idea to Lyric, you know, this would be a great film. Imagine making a film about an FBI informant. Unfortunately, where the hell are you going to find an informant who's going to agree to participate in a film? And at that point, Lyric just happened to mention. So you decided making a film about an FBI informant, at least one way to get into this and, and kind of uncovering this, uh, really these series of conspiracies mm -hmm. that are how people make their living apparently, mm -hmm. was to follow one FBI informant and you shared that idea with Lyric having no idea mm -hmm. that she had been in touch with an informant all these years. That's right. And so, I mean, but it's one thing to go and socialize with an informant, another thing to convince them to essentially reveal themselves. I mean, how was, how'd that go? Was he just... I ask good questions, I think. And I think it was a int very interesting relationship because I was a very, I was 19, I was very open. I hadn't, I didn't, just way before Edward Snowden, I had no thoughts to surveillance. So I was really a very open person. So he met a very open person who was somewhat impressed by him, by his history having been in the Black Panther Party. I was very impressed. And so, you know, I came to our meeting like that. So someone, these are often how these targets of these cases come to the meetings. The, the informants are people with many more resources than they have. Often, you know, the informants present themselves, they're supposed to be impressive to these targets. They are supposed to be people who the targets want to emulate and look up to. So in that regard, he was perfect. You know, he was not, not saying I wanted to entirely emulate him, but he was a successful working professional who had come from the Black Panther Party who shared a lot of the values and ideas I have about this country. And so that's where we met. So we were, you know, he, because we met there, he shared sort of intimate things about himself as well. And so I knew there was a complete trust there. Yes, he's an informant, but I also knew that he probably wouldn't screw us while making this film because I knew that there were some details about his double life that I knew that he had revealed to me that should they come out, it was almost like leverage. But we trust, I really felt that there was a good trust there. What is the map on the wall? Why is the what? Why is the map on the wall? Find my locations around here. Is there significance to the red lines? Yes, 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 yes. It's regarding the work I do. No, I'm going to give you the picture. I'm going to put them up on here. It'll be better for you because I don't want to explain nothing to you. You got it. That's it. Don't ask no question who they are. I'm giving you something that you shouldn't be seeing anyway. You know something? I know. You're always getting fucking headshots. Didn't you say you wanted to do this project? Yeah, don't you ever give it a break? Now I can see why them fucking celebrities don't like Pazarazzi. You're not going to tell us anything? No, I mean, these are just, these are all targets that's in suspected areas. For some reason, they got a big population of Muslims that come from the various countries over there to come to school here. Moroccans, Somalis, Iranians, Saudis. And then they all go back from where they come from. I don't have no feelings for them. You're making the Islam look bad. You got to go. But now here we are. We're at Sundance Film Festival. You couldn't be in a more visible place. Congratulations for being here with the <laughs> film. What happens now to him? Well, he's been deactivated. He hasn't been working for the FBI for about a year and a half, two years. It's been a while since he's been in contact with them. And he kind of 
he, at the point that we met him, we didn't really know why he agreed to let us film him at the time that we started filming, but he did. And we didn't question it. We said, okay, let's go. Uh, and ultimately, now that we look back we, and we know more about him and we know more about his life and why he would agree to this, basically when we met him, his usefulness as an informant had kind of expired. At the height of his career, he was making $150,000 per case. But because he was exposed in the case where Lyric met him, his identity was revealed and he had to move down south, he didn't really have that same connection with this community of Muslims in the New, in the New York City area that the FBI was interested in. So he was getting like very small like not not big investigations that he'd been getting previously, so he wasn't he wasn't getting the same amount of money at you know at the time that we met him, and said maybe this is an opportunity for another for another chapter of my life. And plus, you know I think he felt really kind of taken advantage of by the FBI and didn't feel like they really recognized or acknowledged his work and the kind of sacrifices he had made. Wow. So. So is he here? No. No. Okay. Undisclosed lo location. Okay. All right. Um, how do you go about filming somebody who's being, like how did you go about producing the film itself? Did you use surveillance cameras too? Oh, um, you wanna that? Well, we, we, th we, we thought about it, you know, in terms of like how do we follow him? He's going to meet with the target, he's going to meet with the, the FBI. And there are times that we are kind of following him and shadowing him from as much of a distance as we can without getting too close and having our own presence become made, made aware of. Uh, but for the most part, we we were we were in his his safe house, you know, spending time with him while he's in conversation with the FBI on the phone, getting text messages from them, texting also the target of the investigation, and that's really kind of the vantage point that the the, the film the film operates from, you so know, observing in, from that position. In better this world, we see this informant go ahead and and really convince these boys to make Molotov cocktails to possibly disrupt the Republican National Convention. In your film. Are we watching informants actually set people up in that way? Although they're both considered domestic terrorism cases, like Better This World did profile a domestic terrorism case, I think the primary difference is that our main character has principally investigated Muslims. Throughout his whole career, exclusively every person of interest has been Muslim. You know, and so I think that that's the slight difference, is that Better This World does present domestic terrorism, but the face of domestic terrorism that was presented in Better This World is not quite the, the actual face that has been presented as a threat to this country since 9-11, which is usually Muslim. And, and did he turn over all his correspondence to you as well? He gave us his phone. He said, here's my phone, here are the text messages. You know, he played voicemails for us. You know, we were there listening while he was talking with them on the phone. It's incredible. Mm, yeah. How many, how many of these cases are going on? How many informants are in our midst at any given time? Well, after, after COINTELPRO was revealed in 1975 during the Church Commission hearings, it came out that the FBI was currently employing, at that time, 1,500 informants. And now that number is swelled to 15,000. And these are people in all sectors of society. Like, they could be your neighbor. They, they're, you know, they're your church leader. They're, they're in community organizations. They're literally dispersed throughout this country, quietly gathering intelligence. And I think that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to wear wires and gather intelligence. But our film really raises the question, what are these informants out here in these communities doing? Are they investigating? Are they simply recording? Or are they posing ideas and suggestions for criminal activity, as opposed to just seeking that out? That sounds like the answer is yes to that and because, I mean, I guess one reason would be financial incentive, right? I mean, they don't get paid unless the case is prosecuted, is that right? These cases, they begin with what's called an assessment phase. You know, an informant is brought in to make an assessment, like I'm going to assess whether or not this person could be a terrorist. And it's a complicated situation because these informants are criminals, they're con men, you know. Some of them are, you know, people who are trying to work off lesser charges or facing deportation. So there's a variety of individuals, there's a variety of circumstances, but the, all, the vast majority of the informants that have, we've been made aware of are, do have these kind of criminal histories. So these are people who are brought into a situation and say, tell us what you think about this individual, whether you think he's a legitimate threat or not. And, and also, and tell it, but yeah. just on top of that, you know, what a criminal, why would they say this person is not a threat when they know that that's going to cut off their pay, you know? Understandable. So what are you facing in putting this film out? So the film has premiered? Yes. Okay, how is that? We've had two screenings. They've been Amazing. well received, we think. Yeah, I mean, the, the yeah, less... Good response. Yeah. I imagine. The Especially sure people are grateful to be aware of this. I mean, I think, you know, our invasion of privacy is pretty, uh, it's pretty, um, uh, I guess, it's, it's infiltrating every aspect of our lives at this point. But we didn't, I didn't even think about that level, you know? I just think that we live in public and every way, 
but I didn't think that there were people actively, you know. And if I was Muslim in this country, I'm sure I would be terrified because I'm sure this that the Muslim profiling has happened, especially in the wake of 9-11, and it's just probably gone from there. Um, do you document that as well? Like, are you able to get a read on how many of these informants are targeting Muslims? Well, I mean, if you just look at the sheer number of terrorism arrests, all ter most terrorism in this country is Muslim, by definition. I mean, I, don't, I can't really name a recent terrorism case that has been classified as domestic terrorism by the FBI that was not committed by a Muslim. For instance, the NAACP bombing in Colorado, that was arguably an act of terror, but it was not committed by a Muslim, so it wasn't described as such. And on the FBI site itself, it says domestic terrorism. There's another category, white extremism. So by definition, if those are two separate categories, white extremism can't be terrorism. That's why they're not looking for the NAACP bomber as an act of terror. Although historically, if you know civil rights history in this country, that is clearly an act of terrorism against the community. So I think it's actually the definition and how Islam has been criminalized in this country. That is the issue. I'm thinking the Southern Poverty Law Center needs to see this film if they haven't already. Morris Dees, is he involved in the film? No, we haven't talked to them yet, no, but we... They're going to love this Their film. research has definitely informed yeah. the film. They're amazing. Yeah, just looking at their website, you know, after Obama was elected, the number of extremist white ring, like, militia groups exploded from, I think, like, 150 groups in the country to over 1,000. And yet you don't see any cases where the FBI is targeting white extremists. You know, you don't see the same informant-driven sting operations being used against white targets. You know, it's a practice they preserve solely for the Muslim community. Or if you do, it's just not labeled terrorism. Like, there have been white, numerous white people that have driven, tried to get close to the White House with weapons in their car to assassinate our head of state, yet that's not deemed terrorism. That's deemed mental illness. It's deemed, you know, this person had a bad day. That is terrorism. If we're going to have a unilateral definition of terrorism, trying to kill our head of state is an act of terror. But had that person been Muslim... <laughs> Are you, are you concerned for your own safety at this point? Are you concerned about ramifications from the FBI or from, I don't know, any number of people, I imagine? What, what are you feeling like, you know, with regards to the future of yourselves, your, your persons, and this film? I think we've had a lot of support. We've like our executive producer is Eugene Jarecki, and he's you know he's provided us couldn't with have a better a, head like a great <laughs> legal team and legal resources that have helped us kind of vet the film and make sure that we are protecting ourselves. And we've you know consulted with the CC CCR with the Center for Constitutional Rights as well as the ACLU, and these are all people who are who are really excited about our film. Their response has been really, you know, rejuvenating for us coming at the end of the post-production phase and kind of see their response to what the film is and what it says and, and to know that they will be there for any, any unfortunate events. And also when you're doing stories like this in the public interest, when you're dealing with surveillance and secrecy and trying to expose things that are supposed to be covert, you really can't report in fear. You know, like this, this film is a continuance of bodies of work that we've been working on for years, themes that we've been exploring for years. So the FBI should be aware because there are very few people reporting on these issues, honestly, for a wide audience. So I personally, but I think David agrees, we can't really report in fear. No. It's very difficult. Have, uh, have they commented at all? We've reached out to them for comment and they haven't responded. Okay. Well... This is a very interesting story, your story. <laughs> I will be glued to it from as it goes out in the world, and I wish you the best of luck with that, and congratulations on reaching the finish line. Thank you. And uh, sharing something so important with all of us. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Um, this has been another fascinating episode of BYOD. I'm just floored by the collection of films that we've covered here at Sundance, and uh, in that note, this is the end of our coverage of uh, Sundance 2015. And we hope that you'll all support the films as they come out this year in your local theaters. Continue to support documentaries at BYODOCS is our Twitter. I'm Andy Timoner, thanks. <laughs>